Nataraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. This is Canto 10, Chapter 1, and we're on text number 43. Jyotiriya Thaivo Daka Parthiveshwadaha Samira Vega Nugatam Vibhavyate Evam Swamaya Rishiteshwa Saupuman Gune Shuraga Nugato Vimuhyati Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. When the luminaries in the sky, such as the moon, the sun, and the stars, are reflected in liquids like oil or water, they appear to be of different shapes, sometimes round, sometimes long, and so on, because of the movements of the wind. Similarly, when the living entity, the soul, is absorbed in materialistic thoughts, he accepts various manifestations as his own identity because of ignorance. In other words, one is bewildered by mental concoctions because of agitation from the material modes of nature. Now we have a long purport by His Divine Grace. This verse gives a very good example by which to understand the different positions of the eternal spiritual soul in the material world and how the soul takes on different bodies, Dehantara Pratihi. The moon is stationary and is one, but when it is reflected in water or oil, it appears to take different shapes because of the movements of the wind. Similarly, the soul is the eternal servant of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but when put into the material modes of nature, it takes different bodies, sometimes as a demigod, sometimes a man, a dog, a tree, and so on. By the influence of maya, the illusory potency of the Supreme Personality of God, the living entity thinks that he is this person, that person, American, Indian, cat, dog, tree, or whatever. This is called maya. When one is freed from this bewilderment and understands that the soul does not belong to any shape of this material world, one is situated on the spiritual platform, Brahmabhuta. This realization is sometimes explained as nirakara, or formlessness. This formlessness, however, does not mean that the soul has no form. The soul has form but the external agitating form he has acquired because of material contamination is false. Similarly, God is also described as nirakara, which means that God has no material form, but is such it ananda vigraha. Who knows what that means? He has a form of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. But his uh, material forms are illusory or temporary. Both the living entity and the Supreme Lord have original spiritual forms, such it ananda vigraha. But the Lord, the Supreme, does not change his form. The Lord appears as he is, whereas the living entity appears because material nature forces him to accept different forms. When the living entity receives these different forms, he identifies with them, and not with his original spiritual form. As soon as the living entity returns to his original spiritual form and understanding, he immediately surrenders to the supreme form, the Personality of Godhead. This is explained in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, text 19. Anybody know it? 719? I'll give you a hint. Bohunam. That's right. When the living entity, after many, many births in different forms, returns to his original form of Krishna consciousness, he immediately surrenders unto the lotus feet of the supreme form, Krishna. 
This is liberation. As the Lord says in Bhagavad Gita, 1854, I'll give you another hint, Brahma Bhuta, Very good. One who, is the, one who is thus transcendentally situated at once realizes the supreme Brahman and becomes fully joyful. He never laments nor desires to have anything. He is equally disposed to every living entity. In that state, he attains pure devotional service unto me. Surrender unto the supreme form is the result of bhakti. This bhakti or understanding of one's own position is the complete liberation. As long as one is under an impersonal understanding of the absolute truth, he is not in pure knowledge, but must still struggle for pure knowledge. Klesho dhikadaraste sham avyaktasakta chetasam. That's Bhagavad Gita chapter 12, text number 5. Although one may be spiritually advanced, if one is attached to the impersonal feature of the absolute truth, one must still work very hard, as indicated by the words klesho adhikataraha, which mean greater suffering. A devotee, however, easily attains his original position as a spiritual form and understands the Supreme Personality of God in his original form. That's capital H, meaning Krishna. Krishna himself explains the forms of the living entities in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where he clearly says to Arjuna that he, Arjuna, and all the other living entities who were previously in their original forms are separate individual entities. They were individuals in the past. They are now situated in individuality, and in the future, they will all continue to maintain their individual forms. The only difference is that the conditioned living entity appears in various material forms, whereas Krishna appears in his original, spiritual form. Unfortunately, those who are not advanced in spiritual knowledge think that Krishna is like one of them, and that his form is like their material forms. That's Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text 11. Krishna is never puffed up by material knowledge and is therefore called Achyuta. Whereas, what does Achyuta mean? Infallible. Whereas the living entities fall down and are agitated by material nature. This is the difference between the Supreme Lord and the living entities. In this connection, it is to be noted that Vasudeva, who was situated in a transcendental position, advised Kamsa not to commit further sinful activities. Kamsa, a representative of the demons, was always ready to kill Krishna or God, whereas Vasudeva represents a transcendentally situated person to whom Krishna is born. Vasudeva is the son of Vasudeva. Vasudeva wanted his brother-in-law, Kangsa, to refrain from the sinful act of killing his sister, since the result of being agitated by material nature would be that Kangsa would have to accept a body in which to suffer again and again. Elsewhere, in Srimad Bhagavatam 5.5.4, Rishabhadeva also says, Nasadhu manye yata atman oyam asannapi kleshada asadeha. As long as the living entity is entangled in the fruit of activities of so-called happiness and distress, he will receive a particular type of body in which to endure the three kinds of suffering due to material nature, tritapa yantrana. Just uh, off, out of curiosity, does anyone understand what this verse means that we just quoted? Bhagavatam, nasadumanye yata atmanoyam. Rishabhadeva says, I don't think it's very smart to take one body after another uh, when these bodies that we're accepting are giving us so many difficulties. And Prabhupada actually doesn't paraphrase it here, so I just thought I'd mention that. So an intelligent person, therefore, must free himself from the influence of the three modes of material nature 
and revive his original spiritual body by engaging in the service of the Supreme Person, Krishna. Let's read that sentence over again. An intelligent person, therefore, must free himself from the influence of the three modes of material nature and revive his original spiritual body by engaging in the service of the Supreme Person, Krishna. As long as one is materially attached, one must accept the process of birth, death, old age, and disease. One is therefore advised that an intelligent person, instead of being entangled in so-called good and bad fruit of activities, should engage his life in advancing in Krishna consciousness, so that instead of accepting another material body, he will return back home, back to Godhead. Om Ajnana Timiranta Syagnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamahyam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Utapadakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitanscha He Krishna Karuna Sintho Dina Bantho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hare Priye Vansha Kalpata Rupyascha Kripa Sindhubya Evacha Paditanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnavi Pyo Namo Nama Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Hakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Jyoti Yathai Vodaka Parthi Vaishwadaha Samira Veganugatam Vibhavyate Evam Swamaya Rajateshu Atau Puman Guneshu Raganugato Vimuhyati When the luminaries in the sky, such as the moon, the sun, and the stars, are reflected in liquids like oil or water, they appear to be of different shapes, sometimes round, sometimes long, and so on, because of the movements of the wind. Similarly, when the living entity, the soul, is absorbed in materialistic thoughts, he accepts various manifestations as his own identity because of ignorance. In other words, one is bewildered by mental concoctions because of agitation from the material modes of nature. So, this is a wonderful, wonderful verse and a very, very clear purport by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, telling us essentially two things. Number one, that we are spiritual persons. We have our spiritual identity, our spiritual form, our, and corresponding activities and feelings and desires and all the things that basically activate us within this material world. Uh, we have them eternally. And they're full of bliss, they're uh, full of knowledge, they do not decay. Yet, because of misidentification, we have come to this material world and we are accepting one temporary uh, facsimile of our spiritual form after another, a perversion of our spiritual form. Sometimes we call this process of Krishna consciousness, or rather the perfection of Krishna consciousness, we call it sanatana dharma, means the eternal nature of the living entity. So we have that eternal nature, but we've lost that because of material contact. Now, what originally initiated this material contact? Envy of Krishna, lust, self-desire. What else? 
These are general answers. They're all correct. Mistake, we're getting really warm. Ego, okay, another warm one. Basically, yeah, I think mistake's probably the closest one. We decided that why does Krishna have to have all the toys? Why can't I also enjoy it just like that? How come these gopis can't look at me and faint with ecstasy? This is what we think. At least this is the chief desire in this mature world. Sex desire is the chief. They, they say love makes the world go round. We would just change a few letters. <laughs> so the idea is, Lord Jagannath is described. He is like a bumblebee, and he's buzzing from one lotus flower-like face of one gopi after another. And this is what we would have ourselves do in this mature world. We like to buzz from one beautiful face after another. And uh, in, one, in one lifetime after another. And with our own temporary face after another. <laughs> and those faces are not like lotus flowers. Some people are pretty ugly in this world, in case you haven't <laughs> noticed. And ultimately, even if you're not ugly in this world, you will be ugly in this world by the time you die, if you live to old age, but you may not. You may get, uh, you get, you may get nixed out by Maya sooner than that. So this is called Maya. This is the process of Maya. Now, having made this bad decision to try to compete with the Supreme Person and to become the Supreme Person ourselves, then the supreme system of that supreme person is set up such that he doesn't have to waste his time with it. He just turns us over to Maya, and Maya beats the daylights out of us in one body after another, giving us so many miseries on account of our stubborn desire to compete with Krishna. We don't give it up. It's kind of like you know, my godbrother Barahari Prabhu said once, uh, here in Dallas, as a matter of fact, hope springs eternal. <laughs> Think about who? Well, let's read these books carefully. If you've read Krishna book or if you've studied the 10th canto, you know there was one character named Jarasandha. What did Jarasandha do? He was thinking that he, he could attack Krishna and defeat Krishna. And he... 17 times he got completely smashed by Krishna. His entire army was totally destroyed. He had to walk home alone. 17 times. Imagine this. This is like two decades he's going on like this. And still he didn't give up his desire. This is, this is really what's... This is us, actually. That's why these stories are there in the Bhagavatam. Because we have to see... How does this correspond to my own situation? It always does. There's always, there's always a, uh, an analog. For whatever situation we are in in this mature world, we can always find the answer to that uh, uh, situation in Srimad Bhagavatam. Anyway, so uh, we've made our bad choices, and we, as a result of that essential choice to turn away from Krishna, then you get into the vortex, and once you fall into the vortex, you can't get out again. It's like a Venus flytrap. <laughs> you, can, you can buzz into it, but you can't buzz out of it. <laughs> the thing closes after you, and then you're stuck there. That's what this material world is like. And we get sucked down into this whirlpool. Now, when you're in a whirlpool, you get pretty dizzy also, isn't it? So we're being pulled down and we're being bewildered and we're dizzy with Maya. And we don't know what in the world is going on. And that's what Prabhupada is addressing. That ignorance is what's what being addressed in this uh, particular um, analogy here of this verse. We may look into a pot of water or a pot of oil and see the reflection of a wobbling moon, isn't it? Wobbling moon. Why is the moon wobbling? Is the moon intoxicated? No. No, the water is being agitated by the wind, and therefore the reflection is not clear. In exactly this way, we are being agitated by the material modes of nature, and therefore our consciousness, our desires, our activities, our personality, 
it's, it's all messed up. It's all messed up, uh, uh, particularly in Kali Yuga. What are some of the characteristics that are described uh, in, the, in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, regarding the denizens of Kali Yuga? Manda means he's uh, slow. Sumandamati means he's dim-witted. Sumandamati means dim-wit. Uh, Mandabhagya, he's not so, not, we don't have the greatest samskars, we don't really have that good karma. Uh, what else? Upadruta, he's always agitated. The mind is always racing, always frenetic. You see sometimes people, they just, they can't, call. it's like, you think this is Mr. Too Much Coffee or something. <laughs> because, because of the influence of the mode of passion, people just, they're just, they're, they're twisted by the material modes of nature. And in that condition, nunam pramatta, kurate vikarnama, we are mad, pramatta. Actually, the word matta means mad. The word matta alone is sufficient to indicate insanity. And when you say pramatta, it means really mad. Really, really crazy. We're, we're, we're not only dizzy with maya and not only sucked down into this vortex and, and confused and bewildered, but we're completely lost it. What do they call this? Uh, maniacal. <laughs> we're all maniacal after sense gratification. So what is the question of spiritual life until one has regained at least one's sanity? There's no question of it. So people who are Nowadays, you know, we know, we even go to yoga studios and do kirtan. Uh, people are thinking they're going to benefit from Ashtanga yoga while they're in a maniacal, frenetic condition of passion. In fact, most of the time, people go to the, practice yoga just to facilitate their passion. They don't even have the concept of, of getting out of it. They don't even realize that they're into it. If you, you, if you don't know what the solution to the problem is, that's one thing. But if you don't even recognize that there's a problem, that's called pramatta. So this is what happens when we're in this condition. Nunam pramatta kurute vikarnama. When we are in a maniacal, uh, fanatical, uh, crazed situation, hungering after the joys of maya, then in that position we will do anything, even vikarnama. There are three kinds of activities. Who knows what they are? There's vikarma, karma, and akarma. So karma means, really it means only dharma, means activities that are sanctioned or enjoined in the Vedic literatures for gradual elevation within the prison house. That's called karma, pious material activity. Vikarma is anything that is not that, except for akarma, which is Krishna consciousness. Because in Krishna consciousness, we check out of the system of uh, karmic debits and credits altogether. We completely check out of the system. And therefore, there's, there's, there may or may not be a reaction, but we, in, in either way, we've checked out of the reactionary process, so we're not affected by it. So that's called mukti. And... Uh, that is actually not a bad condition to be in because only in the liberated condition can you actually cultivate Krishna consciousness. What we are doing now, in, until we are liberated, is actually more like, we can call it probate bhakti. Probate bhakti under the direction of a, of a bona fide sponsor in the form of our uh, spiritual master. We're not really qualified to render devotional service. And Krishna will not accept devotional service from, from someone who is not pure. But because we have the sponsorship of a bona fide guru who is uh, putting in a good word for us, so to speak, or who is accepting our service and offering it himself, therefore we have some access. This is the good fortune of within human life of uh, coming to the process of Krishna consciousness. So the very first thing is that uh, no sin no illicit sex, no gambling, no eating meat, no intoxication. Because unless one is freed from sin, one cannot even think clearly. One cannot get out of the, the haze of maya. Lazy, hazy, crazy. This is Kali Yuga consciousness. 
And one cannot get out of that until one is at least pious. Where does Krishna say this in Bhagavad Gita? I'll give you a hint at the end of chapter 7. Anybody know? Yesham tu antagatam papam jananam punyakarmanam te dvan vamoha niramokta hajante mam drhavrata. Krishna says those who worship me with firm determination are the ones who are fixed in piety. And as a result of being fixed in piety, they have become relieved of the reactions of their sins in the form of this crazy mentality that we have, constantly hungering after sense gratification 24-7. This is what we call also pratyaya, what's lying within the heart. And each of us has this, and we have to deal with it. How do you know when you have to deal with it? When you chant japa. When you chant japa, then it all starts coming out. Have you noticed? Or you can also get a sense, if you want to gauge what's going to happen to you at the time of death, check out your dreams. What are you dreaming about? Because it's pretty likely that that's what's on your subtle body when you go to bed at the end of the day is probably going to be the same kind of things that are, that are in your subtle body when you go to bed at the end of this life. So if you're not satisfied with the level of Krishna consciousness that you see when you chant your rounds, or when you're dreaming at night, then it can be understood that you have some work to do. So it, it, it is understood. Uh, this is why Rishabh Dev says this. Nunam pramatta kurte vikarma yad indriya pritaya apranoti. When we are convinced of the, our bodily identity through ignorance and false ego, as someone said here, then we will not hesitate to commit sinful activities. And when we do that, then we just get sucked deeper and deeper into this vortex. And it becomes, we become even more and more confused, and we may even lose the human form of life. There's no guarantee. It depends on us. What, are we cult what kind of desires are we cultivating through the association that we accept most of the time? What are we doing most of the time? That's where, that's where we're going. Where are we putting our attention most of the time? That's where we're going. That this is an infallible axiom, you can say. At least it's a rule of thumb. So, nunam pramatta kurte vikarma yarindriya prita ya apranate. And then the, the idea is here, as Prabhupada says, that when one comes to the human form of life, one must become liberated from this ignorance. And verses like this today are there to show us that although you're so convinced that you're cherished ideals and aims and even your personal characteristics and your whole psychology uh, we're convinced that this is all real um the fact of the matter is that it's it's just a wobbly moon reflected in the oil or the water of a false identity of an identity that's likely to change sooner than we'd like it to because we get attached <laughs> also in this material world and uh, things get taken away from us and then we suffer even in Krishna consciousness, we think if, if we gain some advancement or we, somebody, someone else thinks we gain some advancement or we think we gain some advancement in Krishna consciousness, that may very well be just the effect of some good karma. You can tell. If you suddenly change into a malefic period, then I've seen people who are very good devotees, they just change and then they, suddenly they're gone. And they, they're, you find them frequenting nightclubs and so many other things that we're just totally out of character. So we don't really know who we are, and we don't really know who we aren't either, and we don't even rec realize that we're supposed to recognize who we aren't in this human form of lifetime. So we're sunk. We're sunk. And Maya has us under her thumb. Therefore, the... The first thing we have to do is to become sinless, that is to say, to become a real human being, because I like to say human beings are not defined in terms of biolo biological capability to reproduce, <laughs> or even species similarity. This is not what, you know, humans are not biologically defined. They're defined by adherence to dharma. When we become sinless and are fixed in piety, then we can be properly said to be a human being. Having become a human being, and sometimes it takes a decade or more to become a human being. 
people chant Hare Krishna for decades sometimes and still can't follow the principles. This happens. So sometimes it takes a decade of good association just to become a human being. Then having done that, we can cultivate this knowledge, like the, this verse, the analogy given in this verse, and we can become liberated. Then when we're liberated, then things happen very fast. Why? Brahma Bhuta Prasnatma Nashochati Nakangshati Samasarveshu Bhuteshu Madbhaktim Labhate, Krishna says. Param Bhaktim Labhate. One gets to the topmost devotion, that is to say, pure devotional service, only when one is liberated. Because there's no more obstructions. In the beginning of Bhakti, we have some initial faith. It sounds good. It resonates. The, the Kashmir Shaivas have a nice word for it. They call it prati avigna, recognition. Something rings true. Yeah, I know this. This is right. This, I know it's true. When we hear, and that that strengthens our faith. And we, when we invest our faith in sadhu sangha, because none of the five limbs of bhakti, major limbs of bhakti that are uh, presented by Rupa Goswami and his bhakti Goswami Sindhu. None of them can really be perfected without sadhu sangha, if you think about it. Who knows what these five items are? Most important activities of devotional service. Yeah, Bhagavata Shravana, Nama Sankirtana, that is to say, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam in the association of devotees, that's the qualification. Rasika Isaha, it says. And performing Sankirtana. Sankirtan, by definition, means together with many devotees. Living in Mathura, worshipping the deity or Tulsi. And, and to associate with devotees. You see? So I, really, all of these, although they're different processes, but they all involve association. So someone told me, Prabhupada said once, uh, association is 90% of our advancement. And Chaitanya Chaitanya definitely says, Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shastra Koi, Lava Matra, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoi. All perfection you will get from Sadhu Sangha. All perfection. <clears throat> now, uh, we know that when something is stated three times in the Shastra, as it is in this couplet, that means it's going to be on the test. Same thing with Harer Nam Eva Kevalam, etc. So, we want to become human beings, we want to become liberated, and then we can actually start to work very fast in devotional service. Then, all the obstructions having been removed, as I said, we have some faith, we invest it in Sadhu Sangha. What comes after Sadhu Sangha? Bhajana Kriya, we begin to worship Krishna and follow this, these five processes that we just mentioned. Then, as a natural consequence of that, what will happen? Anartanivritti, all the nasty habits will fall away. All the dross will melt away when you heat gold. When you melt the gold, any impurities, they will separate. Mm -hmm. So the bhakti, but it has to be tivra. The temperature of that gold has to be hot enough, otherwise that will not happen. And similarly, in devotional service, we have to be hot. <laughs> hot bhakti. Like they say, hot yoga, right? <laughs> Fired up. Yeah. Has to be molten gold. By the, by the divine grace of the Lord in the form of Srimati Radharani or her representatives, we have to become like molten gold. We are like molten gold already. We're parts and parcels. That's our, that is our original constitutional position. It's simply this dross is confusing us so much that we cannot remember our position. And that's another thing here, that now that we're on the liberated platform, at least theoretically in terms of this purport, um, it's just really hard to pass up this uh, tempting opportunity. If you look in the last line, Guneshu raganuga to vimuhyati. Raganuga, the word is used. Raganuga vimuhyati. Now, in this verse, of course, the term Raganuga doesn't mean Raganuga Bhakti. It means you're following your Raga in the material world, right? 
So everybody, raga, after all, it means attachment. It means your spontaneous attachment. As long as we're conditioned by maya and impelled by the, or compelled by the three modes of material nature to act, then we develop a temporal raga, a temporal attachment, and we follow it. That's called raganuga. And the result is the last word of the verse, which is vimuhyati. We are bewildered thereby. That's what bewilders us. But the same attachment, if you apply it to, the, to Krishna, or more often than not to Krishna's devotee, then that attachment will elevate us out of this mundane attachment. And there's practically speaking, there's no force in this world uh, that can help us to get freed from the strong attachments that we have in the material world. Only this higher taste of attachment to Krishna and his pure devotee, that can help us. That will take us out. And when we do that, um, tishtan vrajetad anuragi jnanugami. Then when we are beyond anartha nevritti, what comes next? Ruchi, we get, just like we have here, we, at least I don't see him here, but Nama Ruchi. We have taste, particularly Nama Gane Sada Ruchihi. This is one of the symptoms of the next stage, which is Bhava. We have a strong taste for the holy names. I was reading this uh, wonderful new book by Bhakti Vikas Maharaj about Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Vaibhava. Very, I highly recommend it. So he was stating there that uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur had a very strong taste for the holy name of Krishna. And whenever anyone would come and ask him, how can I become deeper absorbed in bhakti, love for the Supreme Lord? He would invariably recommend focus attention on your chanting. It's the main thing. Chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. This is the most important thing. This is, after all, the Yuga Dharma. Now, <clears throat> when we are, have a taste for this chanting, and then we become addicted to it, asakti, we cannot, if somebody takes away our chanting, then we freak out. That's a good sign. That's wanted. Uh, John Lennon, uh, when he was a heroin addict, came to Srila Prabhupada and said, you know, how can, we, how can we tell who's a bona fide guru? And Prabhupada said he's most addicted to, to Hare Krishna. <laughs> he's most addicted to chanting Krishna's name. See? So that's called asakti, and then from asakti, what comes next? Not prem. Yeah. Actually, nishtas first. Sorry, I missed it. That we have to become fixed. Then we get the ruchi, then we get the asakti, and then we get bhava. <clears throat> so bhava uh, is the dawning of the love of God. We get some glimpse of what we might be. And that's where this purport is also significant, because Prabhupada is emphasizing in this purport that we have a spiritual personality. We have an eternal, original personality, which is non-different from us. In the spiritual world, we are the body. Think about that. We like to preach that you're not this body. That's only true in this material world. In the spiritual world, you are your body. You already have a particular form, a particular name, a particular service, a particular feeling, particular desires for serving Krishna. Don't you want to find out what that is? That's what this process has to offer. And only this process given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu can offer us this. Others will most likely mislead us because there's a lot of what we call rasabhasa. Even in other Vaishnava systems, it's just not so clearly uh, stated. So, uh, therefore, I say it is temp it's a little tempting to, to play on this word, Raganuga. Now, the, the important thing to, here to note further is that Raganugato Vimuhyati. As we, be, as we follow this Raganuga process under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master only, not otherwise, bookmark that, because nowadays in Kali Yuga and by the grace of of the Sahajyas, who are predominant nowadays. Uh, we have so many opportunities to hear so many things from Vrindavan, uh, which are not authorized, and which will not help anyone, including us. And uh, so the, but Raghunuga Bhakti always has to be practiced under the careful guidance of a bona fide spiritual master. Whenever 
Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was traveling throughout the length and breadth of India. He met with many scholars, saintly persons, mystics, yogis, uh, spiritualists, sadhus, and devotees. And whenever they wanted to have a spiritual discussion with him, the first thing he would ask, under whose direction are you performing devotional service or conducting your spiritual life? That was the first question. If the person did not have a very clear answer, then he generally would not prioritize discussion of spiritual topics with that person because it's understood. The person cannot know anything. This is such a crucial point, and it's the subject matter of an entirely different lecture, so I won't dilate on it too much. But just consider the ramifications of this verse. Tarakeshu apratishto shrutayo vibhinna na savrishir yasyamatam na bhinnam. Dharmasya tadvasya nihitam guhayam mahajano yenagata sapantha. The real path, Mahabharata says, is whatever the Mahajana advocates. We know in Bhakti there are 12 Mahajanas. They're mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And they have their representatives, such as Srila Prabhupada and those who are following him. Uh, this is the Mahajana process. Well, whatever path the Mahajana advocates, that we should follow as the, to, in order to understand the truth of Dharma. Otherwise, arguing alone, it can never be conclusive. Even the scriptures say conflicting things, contradictory things. And again, we'll find ourselves lost in that confusing, dizzying vortex of Maya, uh, like a ship without a rudder in the middle of the Atlantic. The Atlantic Ocean is notoriously rough crossing. And if you don't have a rudder, <laughs> good luck. So this mature world is like that. This Bhava Sagara, the ocean of, materialist, uh, of materialism, it's just like that. Ocean of worldly existence is very, very difficult. We need to have some steady guide, some stable authority who can monitor our progress and keep an eye on us because we're like cows who stray off the path. Dova Mangala Thakur actually wrote a nice verse like this. He says, my dear Krishna, you are the Lord of the cows. Gopal, who could ever even imagine that Gopal would lose a cow? So please control my cows as well, my go. It's a play on words. What does go mean? Senses also. So please keep my go from straying off the path as well. Keep my senses from straying off the path of Krishna consciousness. So this is, this is our condition. At least, um, well, not at least as neophytes forever, this is our condition. Because even in the spiritual world, there's perfection, and then there's better perfection and superlative perfection. What does Rupa Goswami call that? Purna, Purnatara, and Purnatama. Perfect, more perfect, and most perfect. So spiritual masters are always there, even in the spiritual world. <clears throat> so this is the idea. Under the direction of a spiritual master, Tishtan Vraje, one should live in Vraja. Tad Anuragi, uh, tad, uh, tad Anuragi Jananugami. Tad Anuragi Jana means following some person who has uh, real attachment for Krishna, pure bhakti, spontaneous devotion. These devotees are called ragatmika bhaktas. And the one who follows them is called raganuga bhakta. This is the terminology of Rukhwasami. So uh, this is all affected, all these things, they are affected uh, through the agency of Sri Harinama. Harer nama, harer nama, harer nama, eva kevalam, kalau nasyeva, nasyeva, nasyeva gatiranyatha. In this Kali Yuga especially, there is no other way than to take shelter of this Harinam. All we can really do in our dizzied condition, drowning in the vortex of all Maya's confusions, conflicting worldviews, uh, ever-changing personalities, ever-changing bodies and desires and, and karmas and reactions. All we can do is raise our hands like Lord Chaitanya and say, Hare Bo! Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! Krishna Krishna! Hare Hare! Hare Rama! Hare Rama! Rama Rama! What does that mean? It means help!
This is what we can do. Everybody, it is within everyone's power to do this. If you don't, Jayapataka Maharaj, many years ago, he said, if you don't have love for Krishna, then you should cry out, Hare Krishna, I don't, have, I don't love you, Lord, please help me. And if you can't do that, then you should cry out that I can't do that. <laughs> and if you can't even do that, then you should cry out that I cannot cry to cry for Krishna in infinite regress. <laughs> So there's always a point at which anybody can take up this chanting. There, there really is no material qualification. There is no material bar. Now, what is, that's the positive side. What's the negative side? There's no excuse. You have to do this. This is Mahaprabhu's command. So these are just a few things uh, that we could say about this very rich verse uh, there's many many more like it Vasudev is giving very uh, enlightening instructions trying to pacify his uh, demoniac brother-in-law Kamsa uh, and we know that Kamsa didn't take really advantage of these instructions but we can Vasudev okay I'll stop here anybody have any questions or comments yes Prabhu you need the mic for the internet, I think. Hare Krishna. So, um, you, thank you. Thank you very much. You mentioned um, you know, the Sadhu Sangha is a very, very important uh, item in our attempts to become spiritually uh, advanced. What, what is it, actually? Could you define Sadhu Sangha? Because there's some new people here. Sadhu Sangha means to associate with saintly persons. And associating with saintly persons especially means to associate with devotees, because devotees are the best of the saintly persons. There are many different kinds of saintly persons. Even Bhagavatam is fairly liberal. Um, those who are impersonalists are also saintly persons to the extent that they're following Dharma and trying to become spiritual. Those who are practicing yoga in in, a, in terms of mundane morality, even the Buddhists can be considered saintly persons, although they're atheists. And, and uh, technically speaking, according to their own teaching, non-spiritual. The, the Buddhists don't believe that there is any such thing as spiritual existence, in case you didn't know that. So, and of course, Christians, Muslims, Jews, anyone who is really hankering after God, sincerely, uh, that person can be considered a sadhu in a general sense. But <clears throat> the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are so sublime and so elevated that even amongst advanced transcendentalists, even those who have realized the impersonal Brahman and have become liberated according to the terms that we described in chapter 18, text 54, Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma, that is to say he has realized his spiritual nature and he's fully identified with it therefore he's fully joyful because that is the nature of the self without without any extrinsic imposition the nature of the self is to be fully joyful consequently he doesn't hanker after anything doesn't whine about anything or cry for anything and doesn't um, um is not impelled by passion within this world either uh, and therefore, because of that, he can see all living beings equally. In that liberated condition, then one can get pure devotion. So it, go, it's, it goes without saying that if someone is uh, in pure devotional service, then he's already liberated. He's already liberated. Because of the high condition <clears throat> of devotional service, the, the elevated status of devotional service. So Sadhu Sangha especially means... For those who are trying to practice Krishna consciousness, obviously, you don't go to the impersonalists and learn about Krishna Bhakti, because they don't know about Krishna Bhakti. You have to go, just like when you go to college. If you want to become a doctor, you don't, you don't enroll yourself in the, in the, in the uh, mechanical engineering department. It just doesn't work. You have to train up under a doctor. So similarly, in spiritual life, it's like that. If you want to become a Vaishnava, if you want to become a devotee of Krishna, uh, and this is the only liberated state that can really last, according to the Bhagavatam, ye anye, um, what is the verse? Who knows? 
ye anye aravindaksha vimukta maninath. Those who are think they may think themselves liberated, but because they have no regard for your lotus seat, Lord Brahma prays to the Lord, therefore they fall down again. So we see this. And Prabhupada says this impersonal liberation, it's a little bit like uh, he gave the analogy I heard the other day on a, a recording. When he was crossing the Atlantic Ocean, he said that for two, three days, it was very peaceful, very calm. Everybody liked it. But after some time, it became monotonous. <laughs> and eventually, they came to Canary Islands, and everybody was thrilled <laughs> to get off the boat for at least a little while. One minute. So similarly, this impersonal liberation, it, it cannot satisfy all of our tendencies, of our personal. Remember, we have an eternal personal identity, and impersonalism cannot satisfy that. It will frustrate that, and that's why they have to fall down again. Their desire, the natural desire for society, friendship, and love in the spiritual world, that desire cannot be fulfilled by impersonalism. So amongst the transcendentalists, the devotees are the best. And even amongst the devotees that we kind of hinted at the end of this class, that even amongst the devotees, there's also different classes. If you want to worship Krishna as a lover, then you have to follow those who are teaching that. If you want to worship Krishna in a parental mood, you have to follow those devotees. If you want to worship Krishna as your friend, you have to follow them. If you want to be Krishna's servant, then you follow them, etc. So even amongst the devotees, one has to choose very carefully. Specialization. This is called spiritual technology. Is that okay? So, so early, early in the class, you were, you were mentioning how, about that mistake that we made, that original desire that got us in this vortex of troubles. Yeah. Um, one might think, like, what, what's, what's wrong? I mean, Krishna has so many... A girl friends, why can't he share some? <laughs> I mean, I mean, he's not a tyrant. He's a he's a good guy, a, a supposedly. Yeah. Um, yeah. One can object or reason like that. <clears throat> yeah, this is a very good question, actually. And the answer to this question is that actually, yes, Krishna has many many girlfriends. He, I suppose, he could share them with some of the other men around. But there's a problem there. The problem is that there actually are no, no other men around. None of us are men. We have this purusha abhiman, uh, means the ego of male ego, and it's not real. All of us are female in our constitution, in essence. And that means that Krishna is the only male and everyone else is meant for pleasing Krishna. So... In, in principle, if there were other males, then it would be uh, fair for Krishna to share some of his girlfriends, I suppose, if you, if you want to say it like that. Um, but, you know, this is the problem. That we're, we're actually, you know, when, when, when a woman tries to imitate a man, that is considered to be a form of perversion. And that's what we see. This is what we get, those of us who are men. Therefore, Prabhupada, one, one of, uh, someone once asked one of Prabhupada's godbrothers, what is the position of women in Krishna consciousness? And his answer was, women have the superior position in Krishna consciousness because they do not have this male ego that we have to work on. The soul is essentially feminine. And this is what we men especially need to recognize. Now, women also need to recognize that because we have another perversion in the material world. We have women in female bodies who think that they're men. This is another problem. So, you know, this is, this is why we don't accept feminism, for example. You know, that's another perversion. So all these upadhis, we call them. Sarvopadhi vinirmuktam tatparatvena nirmalam. We have to become freed from all these misconceptions, misidentifications, mistaken temporary activities, ideas, programs, philosophies, desires, etc. We have to just slash and cut through all of that, Krishna says in chapter 15 of Bhagavad Gita. 
And the way we do that is through chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. In the Gaudiya Mata, I was reading uh, this book by Bhakti, uh, the Kaas Maharaj about Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. After, or either after or just before Mangalarti, they sing a kirtan written by Bhakti Vinod Thakur, uh, chastising his mind. And Bhakti, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said, this is a good thing to chant this kirtan first thing in the morning, right away, first thing. Because in the morning you have to beat your mind with shoes. Because every morning we wake up thinking that I'm the Purusha. If not the Purushottama. <laughs> Purusha means uh, male personality, the enjoyer. And Purushottama means the supreme personality of Godhead, Krishna. So we have this conception, misconception. So, is that okay? Yeah, I was just thinking... Uh from the point of view of tattva, that, that's true. Everybody's a, there's only one enjoy, and everybody's else. Even it. even in the from the point of view of rasa, it's quite often true because mostly in our line we're teaching madhurya bhava, means we want to become gopis. Vishnuat Chakravarti Thakur says the fruit of chanting the Kama Gayatri properly is that you will take a female birth in Vrindavan Tham. We all want to become women. So why, why, why throw obstacles in your path? Why throw obstacles in your path by asking Krishna to share some of his with you if you want to become one? There's another way to deal with this, actually. It, not exactly the same question, but related. One Indian man actually became a Christian. He came to Srila Prabhupada and he said, I, I, I no longer worship Krishna because he's immoral. Prabhupada said, oh, and so how, how Krishna is immoral? And he said, well, he dances with other people's wives. And Prabhupada very carefully explained then that, you know, that Krishna is the supreme lord of all the creation. All living entities are his expanded parts and parcels. All the women in all, in all the creation belong to Krishna, including your wife. Therefore, you are the immoral one. You are the adulterer, not Krishna. Uh, this is... So anyway, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, you you said it. You know, if, I was just um, thinking, you know, to to say that from the point of view of Rasa, to say that to a coward boy, uh, I might be risking to be slapped in the face if I tell him, you know, you're also a female. I'm sorry. Yeah, from the point of view of Rasa, you know, if if you if you're mentioning that to a coward boy who is in a different relationship with Krishna. Yeah, I don't think they they would understand or accept that. Of course, they're, they're, of course, they're just in a different. That's true. Bob. Yeah, so we don't we don't really we don't need to discuss these things too much because we don't have the ability to discuss these things too much. Like I said earlier, we whatever whatever notions of Raghunuga Bhakti we have, they're mostly uh, formulated on our mental concoctions, just like all the other. Uh, uh, ideas we have about our self-identity. That's called adhyasa in Shankara Charge's language, superimposition. We take a mundane conception and try to transpose it into the spiritual platform and call it absolute truth. You know, when it's actually, you know, the, most of us, uh, our, con our conceptions of Raghunuga Bhakti are not any different than our other misconceptions of bodily identification. They arise from the same sources, from the three modes of material nature, from the mind, etc. So, therefore, again, we stress the essential necessity of becoming liberated first. And, of course, there's a prerequisite for becoming liberated. You have to become pious. So, first, first follow the principles, then become spiritually awake, and then we can discuss bhakti. And then, you know, when bhakti is matured, then there's a question of raganuga bhakti. This is the pattern. Now, we're very fortunate in case this seems discouraging to anyone, because it, it could, you know, if especially I mentioned it, sometimes it takes people a decade just to become human beings. <laughs> uh, we're very fortunate in that the process of bhakti itself is so powerful that just by chanting this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra very sincerely, a person can, a person can whiz through these processes if he's sincere. It can happen, but we have to, we have to really work at it. We have to work at it. 
but we have the means. We have this. We have the the wherewithal at our disposal. At our disposal by the grace of our spiritual master and Srila Prabhupada. Anything else? Yes, Nityananda Chandra Prabhu. This is uh, just a comment in relation to the um, topic about needing a sponsor. That one one is not qualified to practice bhakti, that there's that verse, patram pushram palam toyam yome bhakta prachati tadaham bhakta paritam prayat prayatamanaha vishnami prayatamanaha and then vishnu chakvita varti takur he states that the second bhakti, he said that the first bhakti is about in that verse, there's two bhaktis mentioned twice, the first one is that it's offered with devotion, but the second one is by the genuine devotee who has devotion, who is Priyata Atmanaha, who is a pure soul. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, so we have now, right here, right now, we have an opportunity to perform this Harinam Sankirtan that we've been discussing because we're having that we're initiating this. Ashta Prahara Sankirtana, Akhanda Kirtan, at least for the next 24 hours, beginning at 9 o'clock. And it seems like it's going to be in the Prasadam room, according to the announcement. So everyone is invited to join. Thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.